I'm Rich Lund, just a guy trying to help out the monarch butterflies, and thank you for taking an interest in trying to help them out as well. One of the topics that viewers voted for in last year's AMA video came from Mary Beth McDonald. She asked what options might be available for failing milkweed towards the end of the season. It's variable as to exactly when it's going to happen, depending upon your location, depending upon your latitude, but eventually your milkweed plants might start to look a little bit haggard. The leaves might be turning yellow, aphids may have found your plant despite your best efforts, that new ant colony just moved in next door. And near the end of our season, we may find ourselves in a pinch to be able to provide quality food for the monarchs that we've taken in. What can we do? Well, the first piece of advice I can offer for this is that we should always be very conservative in gauging how many monarchs we take in with whether or not we can provide for them food. If you predict that with the milkweed you have available to you, you'll be able to take in 20 more monarchs for the rest of the season, then maybe you should scale that back to 15. If we take some monarchs in from eggs and we get them all the way to the third instar and then we're out of food, we've actually done the opposite of what we're trying to do. We have not increased their chance of making it from egg to adult compared to nature, but instead we've actually decreased it. It's not a situation you want to find yourself in. So also for reasons such as this, a lot of people like to set an end date, a time when they're no longer going to take in any new eggs or caterpillars. For me, based upon where I'm at and how much milkweed I know I have available to myself, my end date is I won't take in eggs or caterpillars after the first week of September. To be fair to Mary Beth's question though, I think she maybe is looking more for an answer of what can we do to rejuvenate the milkweed or to keep the undesirables off of it or both. For rejuvenation, one option is somewhere in the middle of your season, before you get to the end of the season, is to actually cut back the stalks of your milkweed that are growing. Assuming it's planted in the earth and not a potted plant, this will encourage new stalks to actually sprout up from the root system. In a way, it's like hitting reset on your milkweed plants. And as long as you're doing it early enough in the middle of the season, by the time you get near the end of the season, you'll have some stalks that have some new fresh leaves on them. Of course, though, there's an obvious downside to this. In trying to have more food near the end of the season, we actually have diminished how much food we have in the middle of the season because we just cut down the plants that were providing for us that food. So it is an option, but many may feel that it has a downside which is equal to the actual problem we were trying to solve. Is there something that we can do to our milkweed plants to keep the undesirables off of it, but at the same time will not interfere with monarch butterflies deciding to do business with us? I wish I had an answer for that. I think just about every gardener, whether it's about milkweed or any type of plant in their garden, would be in love with any product or process that could keep certain pests such as ants and aphids off of their plants, yet at the same time is still inviting in the butterflies that visit their garden and their flowers. You figure out a way, you let me know and you let me in on that patent with you. Now there are some gardening tips and tricks that I've read about on gardener blogs and other websites. Sort of like home remedies for what you can do to deter certain types of insects away. Like I've heard, ground cinnamon near the base of a plant will keep the ants off of it. Or even used coffee grounds can do something similar. The thing is though, for every tip and trick I've heard, I've also read plenty of comments of people describing the tip or trick not really being that effective. And added on to this is that sometimes placing such things at the soil, depending upon what it is, can actually alter the pH of your soil, which in some cases, depending upon how much it's altered, can harm some of the milkweed plants or just other nearby plants in your garden. I don't really know if home remedies are the best route to go for this. So what can we do? If the end goal of why we're trying to solve this problem in the first place is to ensure that we have enough food for the monarchs that we've taken in later on in the season, again, I'll default back to the idea that we just got to be conservative in how many we are taking in later on in the season. But let's say you do all of that and you still, for whatever reason, find yourself in a food pinch. That's when we might want to have some type of safety net, some type of backup insurance plan. One such option is an artificial milkweed diet. Before we go into the details of this though, let's get a few things clear first. I am not at all recommending that this is an equal substitute for actual milkweed leaves. The best option, if you can, is of course, milkweed itself. But this kind of stuff can stay in the freezer for years, and it's there if you need it in a pinch. And the last thing to be clear about is that this is not a product endorsement. I haven't stated what the brand is of this product, nor where I purchased it. And I'm not going to either. But if you type into a search engine, artificial milkweed diet, options come up for you. Now with that out of the way, the rest of this video I'm going to show you how to prepare this diet and then we're going to see it in use with a few caterpillars taking them from egg all the way to fifth instar. Here we go. 
Hey, either my scale is off or they gave me some extra. So at roughly 50 grams, I'm going to only make half of this. I'm going to store the other 25 grams or so in the freezer where the product says it has an indefinite shelf life. Okay, so there's roughly half of the dry mixture and the rest I keep in the bag and I'm just going to put this in the freezer. Now instructions say that to make the whole batch we need 246 milliliters of water. Since we're only doing half of that, we only need half as much, so 123 milliliters of water. And since water's density is 1 gram per milliliter, 123 milliliters of water is 123 grams of water. And yes, I did zero out the uh, glass container first. Next up, we got to heat this up to boiling or near boiling. Microwave. Commence the mixing. I gotta admit, this does not smell very appetizing. But then again, I am not a monarch caterpillar. And to be thorough and get the rest, I'm going to use this uh, slappy here. I know that's not what they're really called, but in the restaurants I worked at, we called these slappies because we could slap each other with them. Really hurt on the back of the arm. Especially when you didn't know it was coming. You can see it's already cooling off and uh, becoming quite solid. Yeah, guys, I don't really think you'd be interested in this stuff. Okay, it's fully cooled, solidified, coagulated, and here's what it looks like. Kind of pasty to the touch, just like we hoped. We have here seven eggs, one of which, as you can see in the upper left, has just hatched. I've planned on having six be my experimental group for this. So whichever are the first six to hatch from here, obviously this little guy being one of them, that's going to be our six for the artificial milkweed experiment. Now it doesn't make much sense to try to do this experiment if we're not rearing them outdoors because that's kind of when I'm suggesting this artificial milkweed diet might be used. When you're in a pinch and you're running low on milkweed, then this could be a substitute for it and that's more likely to happen near the end of the season when hopefully we are rearing them outdoors to give them those environmental cues so they can become migratory. Now normally for outdoor rearing I'm using a basket such as this, plenty of ventilation, but the thing is I don't know that this is going to hold the food as easily. So in order to keep track of them a little bit better I'm going to deviate from my normal outdoor rearing and use one of my smaller containers again we definitely want to make sure that water cannot collect in it, which is why I will be monitoring this very carefully along with what weather is on the horizon. But they're not calling for any rain in the foreseeable next three days. And that's really when these first instars, that's, that's what I'm most worried about. Now the, the lid I've actually modified so it doesn't cover all of the small container. Cut out a big portion here so that way there's going to be plenty of ventilation. No chance for greenhouse effect to make this heat up and for it to bake in there. But I also then taped a piece of folded up paper up at the top, so that way there's plenty of shade. When you think about these little tiny first instars, they're normally on the underside of a leaf eating. So I want to give it plenty of shade, yet still receive the natural sunlight conditions, be they indirect or otherwise. So I'm going to grab a portion here. You can see as I scrape it, it's not, it's not like a peanut butter paste or anything like that. It's not really that spreadable. So I'll just kind of scratch away at some portions of it. So we will take this guy while he's nibbling on his egg and we're just going to place that piece of leaf onto our artificial food. He did not even seem to notice, taking a little break from nibbling. And now because another egg has black tipped, we can go ahead and place this here also on the artificial food. Could probably place, you know, all of my cutout eggs here if this was being reared indoors, but being outdoors with the wind, I'm going to wait until they black tip. And in fact, it looks like this one is right now hatching, so that's a good sign. So I think this gives you the idea of uh, how I'll be doing this. Once the other uh, four black tip, whatever the next four are, 
they're going to go on here as well. All right, a couple days into it, Let's see how we're doing. Now, something that I hope bears testament to that we're in this together, you know, I don't always know how videos are going to go. And our six, when they hatched, did not seem to be eating much of anything. They wandered away from the artificial food. And so what I had to do, I started them on one milkweed leaf. Once they started eating from that milkweed leaf, and I saw that they finally got their stripes, that's when I've now switched them over to the artificial. From what I understand, from what artificial food instructions recommend, it is said that they will not take to the artificial food if they are in a later instar, fourth and fifth instar especially. So you want to get them onto it early, but even so, they can still be picky eaters. So hopefully, if you have to use this option, hopefully you have at least one milkweed leaf, in case you run into what I ran into and they don't take to it right away, and get them started on that. But since then, since them getting their stripes, I have relocated them onto the artificial milkweed diet, and I'm seeing frass. Uh, some of the frass moved just a little bit, but I am seeing frass, and while, yes, that could be excrement from the milkweed leaf they ate, it's been now a day and a half, and I, I've seen more frass too, and they do seem to be acclimating to it. Let's get a closer look. I'm also finding early on this stuff dries out. This was fresh this morning, and it still seems quite fresh, but it will dry out when it's not kept in that container and refrigerated. And so I've... Um, I've experimented around a little bit with just like adding a little bit of water to moisten it, re-moisten it again. That seems to be working all right. But again, only time will tell if they continue to feed from it. So we will uh, place these guys back in their basket, uh, rearing them outdoors. And we'll, uh, we'll check in on some things in a few days. But hopefully it continues to go well. See you in a few. Okay, day 11. I don't actually know what day it is. I should have kept track, but I didn't. All right, let's check and see how they're doing. Oh, there's six. Yeah, okay. All here and accounted for. Um, some some other observations I've noticed is I'm keeping my food in the fridge for them, and when I bring it out, if it's still refrigerator temperature, they tend to not want to really climb on it. But once... It is a, a normal temperature, what they're used to, what they are at. They are much more readily eating from it. So, all right, just a few instars left. All righty. Things are moving along. We're at uh, day 70-12, I think. And we've got fifth instars. Either they've been, or they just molted his fifth instar. And there's a guy there on the side. I don't know if he's getting ready to maybe even J-hang. It's like they know I'm coming. They're not sitting there eating it when I'm pointing the camera at them. But I can see from, of course, their growth and development, they've been eating it, and uh, from the frass, too. Frass cleanup is not as easy, I would say. Um... This stuff, this is from this morning, and it's still moist, but when this stuff dries out, it falls with the frass too, so you just kind of, you kind of end up wasting some of the food, but I think that just, that's part of the game. Take a look at the others. There's the other tray, and I can see right here is a, a molt. It's molted the skin recently okay cool but yeah I think um, some are gonna be jay hanging probably tomorrow the next day but yeah uh, we're gonna take it all the way to the pupa stage so I'll check back in with you when uh, I don't know I guess when they're jay hanging see you then it looks like things are going well I see four immediately We've got One right there. Maybe he's looking for a place to J-hang. Another guy uh, still munching down, I think, on some food there. 
There's another one tasting it, eating it, munching. And this guy's uh, on a walkabout. Sorry about the wind. Not much I can do. Wanted to get this on film. Um, one I had not noticed had Jay hung already. And in fact formed the chrysalis on the bottom of my basket here. So he took me a little bit of time to find. We do have a J hanger up here at the top. So two of our six are done taking in food. And so I would say already this is successful, it seems. But of course the proof will be in the adults. Hopefully they will be nice healthy adults when they emerge, but let's not let's not count our uh entomological adults before the pupa has he closed, so to speak, right? Okay, for documentation purposes, all six are now in chrysalis and have been for a few days now. I've located them on the uh, yarn as I normally do, but I've used the green clasps. because I had six green clasps and nothing else was using the green clasps. So here's one of them. And we keep on going. Here's a number two. And continuing on, number three. Number four. Number five is right there. Not related to this, but I did have a uh, monarch decide to jay hang on a milkweed leaf, so. And then here is lucky number six. Not artificial diet, not artificial diet, but artificial diet. These next three are three of our six. Got to admit, it's strange. The first three came out on the same day. And I don't know if it's worthy of note, but one had definitely made the chrysalis before the other five had, and another one was Jay hanging. I'd have to assume that two of these were those two, and yet, even though they had different times of making the chrysalis, they have all emerged on the same day, which is interesting. Whereas the other three, just starting to change, looks like maybe it would be out tomorrow or the next day. Again, that adult there is not one of the ones in question, but the chrysalis right there is. That was one of our six. And then this other green one, green clasp here, this one's starting to darken too, so looks like two of those will be emerging as adults tomorrow. And I would have to expect this next one is either going to start turning today, as far as uh, becoming that translucent, darker look to it, or tomorrow. But again, I don't know how important that is, it's just, you know, kind of a curiosity. But the ones that have come out, they are, uh, they're looking pretty healthy, so cool. Okay, so, hey Sasha. Alright, pretty windy day, but it's also time for their release. The experiment's done. We got six healthy monarchs from the artificial diet, and they are ready for release. They've been tagged. I still tested them for OE just so I've got the evidence that they didn't have it, and they were all clean, of course. It's August 29th, and of course, I thought it'd be a fitting ending to show their release. Thank you very much for checking out this episode. Thank you, as always, for doing what you can to help out the monarch butterfly. Rich Lund, signing off. I'll catch you next time.